name's Christabel Reed, um, and together with Ruby Reed, my sister, we co-founded and direct Advaya. And um, I'm really honored to be kind of facilitating tonight's discussion on roots of resistance, narrative, culture, and power. Um, this is a very big <laughs> topic, um, but I'm really, really excited and really honored to be joined by three such um, special guests. Um, so, uh, Emilia is going to be leaving in after the first half an hour, so we're going to kind of just dive straight into the discussion after um, after I kind of introduce the speakers. Um, so as the discussion goes, please feel free to put your questions in the Q and A box um, as well, and then we can be we, then we can feed them in throughout the event or at the end. Um, so Emilia Roy holds a PhD in political science. Her doctoral dissertation analyzed the processes of intersectional discrimination in the French and German labor markets for care and household services. Prior to founding the Center for Inter Intersectional Justice, she was project director at the German Federation of Migrant Women's Organizations. From 2011 to 2015, she taught intersectionality theory, post-colonial studies and critical race theory at the Humboldt University and the Free University of Berlin and International and European Law at Jean Moulin University in Lyon. From 2007 to 2011, she worked extensively on human rights issues at Amnesty International in Germany, at the International Labour Organization in Tanzania and Uganda, and at the German Agency for International Cooperation in Cambodia. Joshua Virasamy is an artist, writer, and political organizer whose work intersects across political struggles and whose campaigning sits in a variety of organizations. He has been involved in various movements, including Occupy and Black Lives Matter. Joshua uses writing, film, music, and direct action to educate, agitate, and organize towards social change. Joshua is a second generation immigrant who grew up in Hounslow, West London. And our third panelist is Lila June, who is a poet, a singer, songwriter, a hip hop artist, human ecologist, public speaker, and community organizer of Diné, Titehestese, and European lineages. Her dynamic multi-genre performance and speech style has invigorated and inspired audiences across the globe towards personal, collective, and ecological healing. Her messages focus on indigenous rights, supporting youth, intercultural healing, historical trauma, and traditional land stewardship practices. So welcome everyone. Um, welcome Joshua, Lila, and Amelia. Um, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. So tonight we're looking at culture, identity, and power. Um, these are all encompassing, um, not only in social movements, but in our lived experience. And I'd love to hear kind of from each of you how, um, these aspects inform and empower your work. Um, Lila, as a scholar and community organizer of Diné, to has to say in European lineages, there's a direct and clear continuation to the indigenous cultures that your work focuses on protecting and revitalizing. Um, the land which was stolen from your ancestors, um, many descendants will still be living there and there's historical markers of tradition and you're a scholar of traditional culture. Um, could you speak to how this connection to traditional culture as well as to womanhood empowers your work in Indigenous rights, um, supporting youth and intergenerational healing? Yeah, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, so honored to be here with you all. And uh, it's, a, it's an honor truly. Um, I love what Christabel and Ruby put together. Um, I'll just introduce myself in the in the traditional way just to honor my ancestors briefly before I answer your question. Um, so I like to honor my indigenous language. Um, and what I just said was greetings, my, my, my relatives and my people, because uh, in, in our worldview, everybody is your people. Um, and um, I said, I'm from the Black Charcoal Streak Division of the Red Running Into Water Clan of the Diné Nation. 
which is also incorrectly known as the Navajo Nation. Uh, we call ourselves Dene. Um, on my father's mother's side, I'm a Cheyenne. On my mother's father's side, I'm of the Salt Clan of the Dene. My father's father is of the European clans, as far as I know. Uh, and in that manner, I present myself as a Dene woman. Um, so obviously culture is an incredibly important part of my work um, in the world because indigenous cultures are, as my friend says, achingly beautiful. They're so full of beautiful and, and exquisite ways of seeing the world. And so of course, everything I do is is honored and, and, and privileged to be rooted in those worldviews. Um, and I can go on and on about the, the details of what <laughs> those things are. Um, I'm writing my doctoral dissertation now on indigenous food systems and indigenous land management and the intersection of those two things and how, I mean, it's just incredible what people did on this continent uh, and in Australia and other places prior to European arrival and um, the, the, the way that these food systems would, would perpetuate for thousands and thousands of years in the archeological record. We just see it go on and on and on and on. It just keeps going. And, um, and the ways in which they, they, they managed the land and sculpted the land and burned the land and clipped it and tended it and, and kept it going was just phenomenal. So, uh, of course, uh, my indigenous culture um, on my mother's side, uh, my father's mostly European with some native tribes too. So I'm kind of biracial, I'm kind of both. So I, I try to draw on both of those things where I go. Um, but on my mother's side, the Dene side, you know, is a lot of beautiful teachings, which I could spend weeks, months, years talking about. Um, but suffice it to say, it centers around love. It centers around gentleness. It centers around kindness. It centers around humility. It centers around um, compassion. Uh, centers around not centering around humans. <laughs> centering around the whole uh, of, of creation, that the upkeep of that. Humans are just a negligible element within a larger system. Um, and so it's, it's quite beautiful. And, I, and I, I think that it's incumbent upon all of us to actually all of us to reach back to our indigenous cultures, no matter where we are from, because my belief is that we all come from beautiful earth-based uh, indigenous cultures. If you go far back enough, uh, they found a, a effigy in German soil back in 2009, a little clay effigy that was molded by human hands in the shape of a woman. And it is said that these effigies are found all throughout Europe were symbols of feminine sanctity and the, the sanctity of the earth and the fertility of the earth and the fertility of, of the women. And they radiocarbon dated this effigy that was found in Germany and they found it was 40,000 years old. You know, so this is the time scale we're, we're asked to reach into. Um, people think most of human history happened in the past 2000 years, maybe 4,000, but that is just the scratching the surface of who we are. We are ancient. We've been here a long time and further back does not necessarily mean more primitive. In fact, it's arguable that America is the most primitive society on earth, given its willingness to destroy its own water source, its willingness to destroy its own women its willingness to destroy its, the, the future of its own children. I don't know what could be more primitive than that. I don't know what could be more primitive than building a dam in a river that you know salmon need to run back and forth through. I don't understand that. It's the most primitive culture I've ever encountered. So sometimes going back in time does not necessarily mean more primitive. Uh, I'd argue that it's more sophisticated back there and it's time for us to, all of us, regardless if we're descendant of Africa, of Europe, of Asia, of Australia, of the islands, of South America, anywhere to, to, to pray to those ancestors and ask them for help now because we need their help quite badly.
Thank you so much, Leila, and thank you for um, kind of beginning this discussion by expanding our minds um, as to what culture is and, and kind of how far back we can we can think of ourselves um, as connected to lineage and culture. Um, Amelia, I would love to hear your perspective on how identity and power and culture inform your um, your work within social movement building. Um, and also um, how this term intersectionality is being used more and more and you're the founder of the Center for Intersectional Justice. And I'd love for you to kind of unpack what that means. Like, how do we address the intersecting um, experiences and identities around oppression? Um, thank you so much uh, for holding this space and thank you so much Leila for opening with such beautiful words and I think you um, just like set the ground from where we need to go from here. It means that we need to tap into spirituality. I think it's uh, absolutely necessary, important. We cannot move forward if we just stay in our minds. We need to really expand our souls and also this is the only way that we can connect with each other without falling back into the old patterns that we've learned and most importantly without falling back into the hierarchy that is so present in the you know our perception of the world and so present that we feel like we cannot um, divest from it that it's a hierarchy that is inherent to humanity and it's not it's completely built it's completely constructed it's artificial and it's harmful so i would say that identity is for me, uh, expanding, the meaning of identity is ever expanding. So it started with, you know, I started identifying myself with the tools that I was given, or I was like framing my own identity according to how, what society projected onto me. It means, you know, like um, the labels such as woman, black, um, um, queer, you know, which are definitely part of my identity, but also come from, you know, what society has um, cast on people to, to also divide them and, and differentiate them and put them in this hierarchy. So when I see my identity right now, like for me, what I find most expensive is to really look at it from, as Laila said, like really tapping into the soul level and really looking at the connection with others. And that's all what I find, um, you know, that is inspiring and, and, and uh, informing my work. It's really trying to tap into that connection and only with other human beings, but also more generally really trying to dismantle this hierarchy also means dismantling the hierarchy that places humans on the top and everything else as, you know, worthless, you know, that we can um, destroy and, and, and kill and, um, and that it doesn't have any meaning. And that's this thing, that's the notion of value that I find, um, um, really central to the way I articulate uh, oppression and the fight against oppression and tracing it back to this hierarchy because the basis of this hierarchy is the line of the human, you know? So as soon as you can construct other people as non-human, you can do anything to them. This is what has been the basis for genocides, for, um, you know, ill treatment, for exploitation, for slavery, um, for, uh, you know, any, any type of um, human um, degradation that is uh, taking place on earth, like the, the, the basis was always, are they human or not? And so what if we could start looking at this line of the human as something that we should deconstruct and understanding that there's no line of the human, you know, anything that is also non-human is as valuable. It is not a justification for exploitation, for um, murder, for anything, you know? So dehumanization is what we need to look at. It means dehumanization is what we need to understand as the, um, the absolute basis for everything. And so that's why, you know, we need to um, understand, and I come to intersectionality on this because intersectionality not only looks at identities, I think it's a really reductive way of looking at intersectionality because if we just look at identities and how we have more, um, more than one identity, it just really stays on this very superficial individual level that can very easily be co-opted by um, um, neoliberal capitalism. Um, and that's, that's a very big danger. And I feel like a lot of people in our movements that there's 
it's a it's, it's a it's a danger and it's a risk to fall into that trap and to um you know to to do exactly the opposite of what intersectionality can teach us and intersectionality can teach us to divest from systems and to understand how they interplay with each other so i give you the example of dehumanization and so it's understanding how um you know racism because racism bases on the line of the human um uh, intersects with capitalism with you know exploitation and genocide um you know as part of the the functioning of our capitalist economy for centuries on end now and um on the other hand on the other end as well uh, patriarchy so you know the an emphasis on on all the masculine on the masculine in our world basically and it's like really detached from the biological gender because you know it's all of this is a construct so it's really understanding that we need to move away from um, this hierarchization of the masculine above the feminine, the human above the non-human, the white above the non-white. Um, yeah, so yeah, I will stay here. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you so much for bringing kind of hierarchy to the fore as well, because when we're thinking about identity and culture, we're often also thinking about difference, but like difference can start to be seen as like, well, can start to cause oppression when it's slotted into hierarchy that if you're different to me I must either be above or below you rather than having like um I think Lila you and you um and Pat McCabe your mother speak about it as like shifting from the power over paradigm where everything we see we see through this kind of lens of of, of hierarchy um Amelia, I'd love to talk about the kind of the cultural context um, of France and Germany. And I was listening to a podcast that you were on and you were talking about, um, I'm not going to quote you, but it's something about um, France and Germany adopting a kind of colorblind post-race stance. Um, and I was interested to hear how these cultural narratives um, inhibit the ability to move forwards. Um, and to build strong social movements and how particular cultural narratives make certain identities become invisible and that and how that affects social movement building. So yeah, we're we're talking about very harmful rhetoric. Um, and it's it's a form of gaslighting, you know, so it's saying, oh no, you know, like you don't mention that you're black, we don't want to hear about your identities, we're all the same. And it's like, you know, negating centuries of oppression that are based exactly on these differences and it's from the moment where the oppressed people just put it forward and say okay you've constructed us, su us as such and so we want to talk about that and then it's just where it starts you know the the the, the gaslighting the 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 negation um the violence really and so i come from France and I find it extremely difficult to speak about those issues in a French context because it constantly puts you back in your place that's like saying you're not you don't have the right to say that you know we build this system and it's it's our words it's our frames it's our discourse basically this is how I interpret it and so I think um, we need to make differences I mean they are visible right so our differences are visible the problem are not our differences. The problem is the hierarchy, which, you know, puts some on top and others at the bottom. So when people say, oh, I don't see race, you know, as an attempt to perform non-racism, um, well, it hints at the, at the discomfort that is attached to this hierarchy. If somebody would say, you know, oh, I don't see eye color, you know, like, I don't see eye color for me, we all have blue eyes, you know, it would be ridiculous to say that because we don't have a hierarchy that is based on eye color. I mean, we do, but not as powerful and as you know, systemic and institutional as the difference of skin color. And so that's why um, I find a colorblind discourse or color evasive discourse or um, a presumed discourse on, uh, a discourse on presumed post-racialism, um, not only harmful, but also false and a, a re- a perpetuation of oppression. So it's not just an opinion like another. It's it's an active negation of um, how oppression has worked so far. So anybody who would say identity politics are the problem, they're divisive. You know, like we shouldn't be talking about um, um, you know a myriad of different identities. I, I see it as. Um, an attempt, even if most of the time the people who bring those arguments are not even aware 
that they are perpetuating um, oppression. They are not even aware of that, but they, they, they are doing it. And that's also, you know, part of oppression. It's invisible and we perpetuate it without noticing it. This is where it derives its um, tremendous power. Thank you. That's so, so interesting. And um, in interest of time, because you only have eight minutes left with us, I'm going to fire back to you with another question, if that's okay. Um, before, yeah, before, before going back to Joshua to hear your perspective on um, culture and identity and how that informs your work. Um, so I brought up one of the last questions, um, which was, uh, we live in a world of interlocking systems of oppression and to respond to these, um, you know, do we also need interlocking forms of resistance? And if so, how do we kind of honor the specific kind of identities or, or, or differences and movements within resistances to oppression? And how do we build those connections and build scale and build majority movements without subsuming everyone into the rubric of the whole? Like, how do we honor the difference um, and, and build strong social movements? Mm -hmm. So we can do that, I think. So it's my uh, humble opinion because, you know, that's a big question. And I don't, I don't claim to have the answers, but I think that like my intuition in this is to think that we should decenter identities and we should center systems. It means that around, you know, instead of having um, a women's movement or, you know, a movement centered on specific identities, we should have movements centered around systems, you know, like an, um, a women's movement is essentially a, a movement that is against patriarchy. And if we're centering on the movement instead of the, on, of the identity, then we can rally more people. Then we can speak to the complexity of the ways in which a system impacts different people differently. You know, because essentially if we say women, so who are we talking about? You know, and what about, you know, non-binary people and trans people who are also very much affected by patriarchy, but most of the time are left out of these movements or at least are a second thoughts of, the, of these movements. And so I would say that's the same with um, anti-racist movements and anti-colonial movements. Um, it means that they need to be centered around basically white supremacy, which is the basis of, you know, all types of oppression um, that derive from racism. It means that, you know, indigenous people, black people, Roma and Sinti people in Europe um, and everywhere, um, Muslim people in, in, in Europe, in the US and like minorities can just really rally around um, a system and, and understand that they are all affected by the system, albeit in different ways, you know, but of course we're not negating the nuances, but it, it allows for more junction and for more coalition in a way that is that cannot be as easily co-opted by neoliberal rhetoric as if we rally around identities. And that's a difficult thing to do because we, you know, it's like, I, I, I mentioned, I like to mention Audre Lorde who says, you cannot dismantle the master's health with the master's tools. And so that's really our, the effort, that's, that's the task that we need to uh, embark on is to redefine um, our own terms and not fall back into what we know. But the human mind is wired in such a way that we are so scared of what we don't know. So it's so difficult to let go. We clinch on um, what is familiar to us. And I think expanding our minds and expanding and also trusting and having faith is also knowing that we will find the language that we will find the frames that we need in order to escape and in order to divest from these systems. Um, but it requires, um, you know, sometimes we are caught into um, those frameworks because we, we want to act fast, we want to, and I think it's also sometimes a bit of a lack of humility as Laila said, you know, like we've been here for so long our history on earth is so long and what has taken place the past 2000, 2000 years is, um, is, is, is really like, a, it's just minimal. And so we need to bring patience to the process. We need to bring humility to the process and know that it's also bigger than us, I think. And it doesn't mean passivity. It doesn't mean lack of action. It just means that we are stronger when we go in there and that we can bring more faith. 
Thanks. Abolition, yes. Abolition is an amazing framework for that. Like, I'm all for abolition of a lot of things, of money, mm -hmm. of marriage, of, uh, you know, borders. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and the list goes on. Police and prisons, for sure, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, before you leave, I, I'd like to invite um, Joshua to uh, and Lila as well to perhaps respond to Emilia if, if there's anything you'd like to, to share in response to, to that. I just want to say I'm really sorry that I took up so much space at the beginning um, since I have to leave and I would have loved to hear your thoughts, but I guess that it's recorded, right? It's so recorded I will... and we can share it with you tomorrow. So, yeah, I will. I really look forward to listening to it. And uh, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure to be here. And um, yeah, I mean, if you want to keep in touch, I can uh, give my um, social media handle in case you know I think it's it's really nice to have such spaces and and to be able to know from each other so I'd love to hear from all of you as well in the audience and um, yeah thank you so very much for everything I have two minutes I'll, I'll be here to listen to you for the <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much really. no, thank you thank you um so Joshua, I'd, I'd love to go back to our, um, our initial question about talking about the um, how identity and culture informs um, your work. Um, and yeah, I'd love to hear about your experience of this um, and your work for racial justice and your involvement in movements such as um, Black Lives Matter. And I guess there's kind of two levels, I mean, there's many levels to this question, but from where I'm directing it from, there's the, the personal level, which is kind of how identity plays a role in, in, in your work and organizing. And then there's a the movement level where it's like, how does culture and identity show up? Um, and it, it, Black Lives Matter is perhaps an in, interesting one as well, because it's in the UK and in the U, US, which are both completely different cultural or well, historical contexts. Um, struggling and, and, and moving towards um, a similar vision, but how do the cultural contexts, um, US being um, kind of embedded with Jim Crow and segregation um, and slavery, the UK with colonialism, imperialism, they both cross over loads. Um, but yeah, just interested to hear about the, that historical context. They're similar, but they're very different. Um, they're different, but they're very similar in yeah. some ways. I mean, like, the colony was in America, but in some ways you can say the colonies came here. Lots of the communities that were colonized in other parts of the world came to live, including my, my family. Um, and there's lots of similarities in, in what takes place in America and what takes place here. And there's a lot of exchange in, in those systems and, and learnings of how to do imperialism and how to do colonialism and how to colonize people. But in terms of culture and identity, um, and kind of my journey into politics and into BLM. I think culture was kind of what brought me here in the first place, really. Um, and I think culture is kind of what keeps me here as well. Like it was, I wouldn't say insurgent culture, but like culture was like a place of empowerment for me and a place where I learned a lot of things. There's like, obviously there's, there's mainstream culture and there's culture that's trying to indoctrinate and there's culture that's trying to shore up ideology and there's a contestation in culture that's always happening. But also there is there is insurgent culture and there's culture that is um, trying to kind of push back and carve its own space. And I think I grew up with a lot of like rap music, a lot of hip hop, a lot of like a lot of TV and a lot of um, soap operas and things that kind of were informing me in a different kind of way and presenting different kinds of narratives and you know you put Stuart Hall in into the a kind of blurb of this and Stuart Hall talks a lot about how we're not just passive consumers of media we're always trying to navigate and negotiate what we see and what we read and what we understand and there's what's happening there and there's what's happening what's what's happening in the home and what's happening in school and what's happening in the church and we're always trying to navigate that and negotiate that and I think I got a lot from from uh, kind of culture and from kind of like working class culture, I guess. Um, and then what kind of, I mean, culture for me plays such an important role in resistance. Like Claudia Jones, I think is, she said, like a people's art is the genesis of their freedom. And I feel like wherever I look in struggles and wherever I look in movements, I just find so many beautiful examples of how culture has played a role in like uplifting our consciousness in kind of pushing our narratives out there. Um, yeah, it's like, 
it's just so essential to our work. And in the book that I wrote, I talk about a few examples, like I talk about in the Vietnam War, how we use culture and the image in order to push our narratives out there. There's also the minor strikes. There's so many, there's so many examples, even in the, in, in the um, protest last year, like the image of the coast and statue coming down and that being proliferated was like a cultural moment, right? And so I think it's like incredibly important to us and our work. And it's like, I, it's, it's sad because I guess a lot of people don't think of culture as like, as a place where we need to be in contestation. And I don't really see as much as I'd like to see people trying to kind of proliferate into popular culture, especially because like, you know, there, there, is, a, there is a time happening now where there's a lot of, pardon me, there's a lot of like, um, what's the word like, kind of, informing and like um, symbiotic happening between like popular culture and like resistance culture. Like there's what, as our movements and ideas spill out across the internet and into the streets, like lots of mainstream musicians and a lot of um, mainstream chefs on TV and people who are in the cultural sphere are picking up on these ideas and they're proliferating. And that's in some ways why so many corporations did the whole like, you know, statement, what Sita Balani calls statement fever, where they were all like, oh, we also stand for Black Lives Matter. It's because our ideas are proliferating into the cultural spheres. And, and that's a really beautiful and powerful moment, an opportunity for us to really kind of tap into that. And, and the same goes for the environmental movements, right? Like uh, over a long period of time, some of these ideas have been proliferating into popular culture. So yeah, I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg, but I think culture is really, really, really foundational to our work and, um, and to our work in our communities and to our work in terms of trying to shift narratives in the wider society. In terms of identity, again, like identity is how, in a lot of ways is how I came to kind of my politics, right? It's like through my identity and in, in particular designated identities through my parents' designated identities, because it's important to differentiate, I guess, between like self-determined identities or what you might call identities. Like for example, like if you are from the Dine tribe or if you are Palestinian or if you are Kurdish, those are more like self-determined identities that you're that are different to, to me to designated identities. And through these identities are kind of like, you know, some, first of all, they're essentialized, right? And this is something that I think both panelists have spoken about. In the first instance, they're essentialized. We're kind of, we're supposed to believe that these are kind of um, innate uh, characteristics of, of a person, you know, to the point where we now say Black British, um, whereas Black used to be a kind of political category. We used to understand that black is is a uh, is part of a social construct and part of integrating it into our into our thinking as a kind of natural category is by putting the hyphen and being like African American rather than like black or black British. Oh my god, I totally forgot my train of thought. But oh yeah, so there's you you I'm living with this kind of understanding and belief that it's an essential part of who I am. And then there's there's a whole dangerous thing around like. Um, when you have this identity and you see it as essential and you see it as very important, then you begin to shore it up. And then actually there's a dangerous route you can go down with identity where you begin to um, include and exclude. Uh, who's not included, who's excluded. Um, and actually, you know, I guess it's part of what led the Black Panthers to talk about what they call pork chop nationalism, which was kind of um, an identitarian nationalism, a cultural nationalism. But identity is also a way to begin to understand the world, right? Like you, you look at your identity, you understand, you, you start thinking, why is it designated that way? What is the purpose of creating these cat these racial categories? Uh, like what does it does it connect to why the tower block has flammable cladding and is next to the larger sewage works? Does it connect to why the prison is being built here? That like you, you begin to understand actually your identity begins begins to well my identity began to be a way to understand the world and then even further than that it began to be a way to understand other people's identities are a way that the world is formed and then it begins to be like okay actually my identity is not really so geographically bound is connected to what's happening in other parts of the world it's why my my parents were designated as immigrants when they came here there's a whole thing that to be to be learned about citizenship and borders and empire and othering and, and those regimes and actually through identity we begin to kind of i began to have a consciousness of of kind of wider ideologies and you know i guess what um 
bell hooks calls like the imperialist capitalist white supremacist head to, head to a patriarchy she hyphenates them because they're so interconnected and actually identity politics begins with the combahee river collective and i think it's really important we remember that um identity politics was the idea and the kind of practice of it was through the combahee river collective which is a black radical black feminist collective that organized in the 70s and they put out a statement in 77 and they uh, they were kind of like to the left of the mainstream black feminist largest black feminist organization at the time they broke away they put out a statement and they explained that identity politics is a way is is that it's about a way that we can kind of through our own lived experiences through our own kind of learning and unlearning through our own kind of uh, practice of liberation we can understand the world we can understand our environment like through 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 ourselves we don't need to really be it's best it's good to inform our practice through also reading and understanding different lineages and different traditions of resistance but also just through our experience we can really understand the world around us and then very importantly for them their, their identity politics was about coalitional politics because once you deep you know what the hell is going on through your identity you're like okay like i said you start to connect the dots and actually it's, it's less about um kind of shoring up who like this kind of identity and this kind of group are more about connecting and their vision was ultimately and why they broke away and the further to left their, their their politics and their kind of understanding of what it means to be black working class women in america was ultimately linked to a, a project of transformative revolutionary politics in american society and that's kind of where you want to go with your identity like you don't you don't want to stay in the identity politics you want to take that as a mechanism, as a vehicle to build movements, to build power, which is, you know, narratives, culture, power is, is the name of this. And power is really where, really where we want to get to. Wow, thank you so much. And thank you for bringing kind of the three huge topics together in, in such a beautiful way. And, and for also kind of um, making that distinction between self-determined um, identities um, and designated identities. I think that's a really key part of um, of this discussion. Um, I'd like to kind of kind of discuss um, or I'll ask you to discuss um, this kind of concept that if there's a we, there's a they, um, and that there, there's been a lot of criticism um, and, and that, that kind of social movements um, are creating more fragmentation in an already fragmented world um, and society. Um, and I'd love to hear your response to such critiques. Um, when is, you know, if there is fragmentation or, or um, division created, when is that necessary in order to create direction and kind of distinction? Um, and when does it, when does it maybe also sabotage the vision of a movement, but not due to the movement, but perhaps due to the cultural or, or, or kind of mass media perspective? Um, and perhaps Lila, we could um, start start with you, and um, you could respond. You know, drawing on the your experience in community organizing. You know, perhaps with your protests um, at the Dakota Access Pipeline protests. Um, like, how have you seen movements be able to mitigate this this idea that you know social movements create more um, more fragmentation? And just also a note to say that. Um, I saw something in the the New York Post when I was looking at Biden canceling the pipeline, and um, I saw all these headlines saying like um, Biden plans to kill uh, Keystone Pipeline, loony leftist killing all the jobs, and it's like these kind kind of constantly these um, really um, polarizing narratives pushing blame onto people who are trying to create something different, trying to get to that power, trying to um, get to that visionary um, place. Yeah, so you started out saying if there's a we, then there's a they, which has been used to sort of either demonize or discredit movements, which to me are really just people asking for health and equality. Um, and, and, and saying, well, if you're saying Black Lives Matter, then you're saying, you know, that whole thing of then you're saying other lives don't matter. It's like, no. <laughs> but anyways, um, you could argue that race is created the moment a person with white skin puts their boot on the neck of someone with 
black skin. Race is created in that moment. That is where the fragmentation occurs, where these white folks, for example, theor hypothetically, do not see the interconnection, the wholeness, the, 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 the equality, the interdependence of them and this person, not because they're both human, but because they both exist in this creation. Everything in this creation, everything is one. But when we put our boot on the neck of someone else because they're different, that's when we create race. Uh, that's when we create fragmentation. Not to say race doesn't exist before they put the boot on the neck. Yeah, I mean, we're different. Why would we all wanna be the same? What if there was only pigeons in the world? Creator made diversity to sustain this whole world. We know when biodiversity collapses, the whole system collapses. That's why conservation biologists are always fighting for biodiversity. But when it comes to bringing in people of color, they, they don't want that. So to me, to blame people of color for fragmenting humanity because they want the boot off of their neck is ridiculous. It's when they put the boot on the neck that caused the fragmentation. That's what caused the division. And so for someone to say, hey, get your boot off my neck, that's actually the process of defragmentating. That's the process of bringing us back into wholeness again. That's the process of bringing us into oneness again. And so it's really important to, to understand that these movements are simply us trying to recalibrate to reality, the reality that we are all one. And therefore you should not uh, harm another uh, and, 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 and also, maybe you're not intentionally harming, but maybe you are accidentally complicit in a system of harm and that we are trying to wake you up to that. And I'm sure I'm complicit in systems of harm too, in my own way. And I would love for people to wake me up to that and to work for alternatives. Um, now, having said all that, I am very much about praying for our enemies I am very much about seeing the humanity in our oppressor, which not everyone agrees with me on in the movement. They don't want to love the person whose boot is on their neck. And I totally get it. It's totally understandable, but I do. I want to love them. I want to see them. I want to see why they ever thought that was a normal thing to do. Where do they come from? Was Europe a pressure cooker of torture, terror, and dehumanization for thousands of years before they ever went sailing anywhere? Yes, it was. It was a horrific place where people were being disemboweled in the public square, where people were being burned alive, where people were being drowned alive, where the Roman Empire was destroying a, a many, many indigenous cultures within Europe, indigenous European cultures. So I like to see the humanity in the person whose boot is on my neck. I like to see what happened to them. <laughs> what on earth could happen to someone to make them want to put their boot on someone's neck? And sometimes they just wanna do it because they're selfish. That's sometimes true, but sometimes they are trained. They are carrying intergenerational trauma themselves and it elevates us to understand them and have compassion and understanding and, and forgiveness and love, even as that boot is on our neck. And a lot of people don't agree with me on that, but that's the way I feel. And so I would, I would kind of say yes to both things in a way. It's like, no, movements are not fragmenting society. If anything, they're bringing us back into wholeness, back into health, back into reality, uh, and out of that supremacism that Amelia was talking about. And uh, at the same time, I think the whole, when we, when we say there's a we, we create a they, there's some truth to that sometimes, sometimes, you know, where we get so immersed in our struggle that we end up dividing ourselves from our enemy and we end up hating them in return. And I don't think that is our highest expression as people 
in the struggle. At the same time, I don't judge it. I would never ever judge it because when you're in that struggle where you just wanna live the next day, truly a third of my people have no electricity. A third of my people have no running water. We, we <laughs> our annual median income for a whole household is 20,000 a year. Uh, I don't know how much that is in pounds, but it's nothing for a whole household. We just wanna get to the next day. And yeah, we're gonna be angry. We're gonna be pissed off. We're gonna fall from grace a little bit sometimes. And we're gonna, we're gonna have rage. But, so I would never judge that. And at the same time, I would implore us to at least try to reach beyond that rage, take our, 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 our wings back and say, listen, this is our little brother who's hurting us. This is our little sister who's hurting us. Let's pray for them as we fight for our struggle from, for liberation from them. Well, thank you, Lila. Um, Joshua, would you like to respond directly to, to Lila and, and um, to the question of um, yeah. these critiques of fragmentation in, in the social movements? I think what Lila's, like one of the things that Lila's spoken about here about like what like it's such a deep question like how how like if we're going through a process of dehumanization and we understand dehumanization as as an active process that is ordering our society and is destroying our environment and and, and destroying our communities then really what we're talking about is the rehumanization of each other and that's what abolition is speaking about right uh, like a lot of these conversations around abolition are looking at the, the the carceral state the penal systems that we live in understanding that they have a long long history and being like we don't want to we don't want to do that anymore we want to have we have a higher calling of love of loving one another of loving our environment of loving of you know understanding that we're totally interconnected and we have context and we need to understand each other on a deeper level and, you know, and I think Franz Fanon is like a really interesting person for me as someone who he was a um, uh, Martinique's uh, revolutionary psychologist, freedom fighter, who wrote The Wretched of the Earth. And he kind of lived through a period of racism, um, understood it, also lived through war um, and was a psychologist. And through all of his thinkings and writings, he came to a position of like revolutionary humanism. And I think that that kind of that thrust of revolutionary humanism is, is really, really important. And I think when we're thinking about and the reason I'm saying it's difficult is because on one hand, I'm like, yeah, this is what this is what we need to do. And when we talk about collecting a we, um, although we can say there is a day, we're not got we're not. That's the means to the ends. The ends is not to be like and we put they in in internment camps and we re-educate them so that they understand that we need to ab abolish stuff. So. But at the same time, um, at the same time, like there is what people are doing and the lack of repentance and the lack of um, like humanity that they offer people means that we will probably come into confrontation with this, with, with the nation state and with these states around the world. And that will mean that this question of like, you know, that what we want to, where we want to be and what we want to do will come up hard against what we need to do. And I don't want to, and I don't really want to go into that too much because I don't really know what, what, what that means for our movements. I will say that in the past, that has mean that we, ha we have had to bring out the guillotine, <laughs> to be honest. And we've had to um, fight for survival in, in our communities. Oh, hello. You froze in for me. Oh yeah, you're back. Thank oh, you. So I don't know. I don't know where you where, where I lost you or where, where. We have to fight for survival. I think is where you. Yeah. Where so, so so that what I mean to say is that I'm 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 caught in between like what is it? I think about this more in terms of like our communities. What does abolition mean in, in in practice in our communities? And how can we work with transgression and harm and transforming that in our community? When it comes to our oppressors and exploiters, it's it's a more complicated thing. Mm -hmm. But to go to the kind of fragmentation thing, I completely agree with Lila. Like. The, the fragmentation begins at the point of the boot on the neck. It begins at the point of the man in the plantation saying, you 
you are a white worker, you are a black worker. Or we could say, if we're talking about dehumanization, the fragmentation begins at the point that there was a trial in Spain for several decades, a trial that spanned lifetimes that was trying to decide if Indo what they called Indo-Americans at the time had souls. They got together the highest thinkers in Europe and said, we need to decide whether these guys have souls. And then after that, we need to decide if Africans have souls. And they decided that. They said, um, these people have part souls, these people have no souls, therefore they are not human. When we talk about dehumanization, we're talking about literal processes of thinkers, writers, leaders in societies saying they're not human. Therefore, and this is, this is, um, it's what, a, it's what a writer called Grossfogel calls like part of one of the epistemicides. Um, and the person who said, what's the name of those trials? If you look for this essay called like, um, the, um, about the four epistemicides, which he talks about as um, uh, the expulsion of the Moors from Al-Andalus in Islamic Europe and the um, colonization of what they call Indo-America and the witch hunts and the middle passage, the enslavement of Africans. These are the kind of four epistemicides that birth the modern world really everything we live in is in in ways part of the destruction of this stuff this these these knowledge systems these cosmologies these you know the things that Lila's alluding to are ways of relating to the world they didn't just kill people they killed they burned libraries because they wanted to erase a way of being so these epistemicides are the fragmentation for god's sake they are the fragmentation and we continue to live in continued fragmentation and and this is a fundamental way that society is maintained right like it 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 just kind of baffles me that again and again and again i can be reading whatever kind of theory or i can be listening to people but it just comes back to for me it always comes back to divide and rule like the way that they maintain power in society is through divide and rule and it's like an age old i mean i think it's from a greek thinker but like it's just you know in some ways we're very base humans can be very base and we, we, we are lured by communitarianism. We are, we are lured by nationalism. We are lured by being part of a fraternity, belonging, belonging really in a, in a community. And so what they do is they say, this community is, you, you can be part of this community, whiteness. You can be part of this community br being British. And then they're in that community, by the way, they're threatening our community. That BLM stuff is threatening this community. And then, and, and interestingly, what they, what they tried to do, these sick bastards, is they tried to say that we're fragmenting, when of course, like Lila said, all we're doing is trying to unify, right? And, but there's that, there's that kind of level of the discussion around fragmentation. And I think that's the reactionary one. And I think we, we all kind of know what the hell's going on there. But there's another one, right? Because there is the conversation within our movements, where people come to uh, our movements, like Lila's movements, like, uh, like the movements I'm part of and people say you guys you we need to bring our movements together you guys are fragmenting the movement you're speaking about this thing and you're speaking about this identity and you're speaking about this but what about all this other stuff like what about you know what about the working class and um, that's not to just characterize them th those people as like the worst but oftentimes it's people who have a kind of class reductionist politics who say that but also people from the environmental movement are often like that Oh, those guys are really fragmenting the, the movement. And I think I think there is a con, there is a construct that's more of a constructive one as and less of a reactionary kind of destructive one that, than I see from the state. And I think there is an important lesson to take from, from there because I think the thing that Amelia spoke about in terms of like what we need to be thinking is coalitional building, I think that a lot of movements that build ourselves around identity, like a lot of them can get stuck in, um, can get stuck in the shoring up of an identity and can get stuck in, in what, what Emilia calls like neoliberal identity politics. And, and I'm not saying this as like a kind of like, and this is a, 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 a like, this is me saying, let's take the, the provocation from these people from the movement and let's, let's see whether any of it holds true. And some of it does hold true. Some of it is about, some of it does make us think like the, the politics of the Combahee River Collective, as opposed to some of the identitarian politics that I see now, like there is a chasm and there has always been a chasm. There's always been, you know, like, like identity politics has always kind of, there's always been two faces of it. There was this really famous debate in America between W.B. Du Bois 
and um, Marcus Garvey, they had two different ideas of how we do kind of black politics. And that's fine, that's really good, natural that we have these contestations. But there is a, there is a type of identity police, politics that is about that is about exclusion and is about not building coalitions and is stuck. You know, it's not it's not doing that kind of expanding out that I was talking about, trying to really connect the dots and and build wider movements. And it's not thinking primarily about power. You know, and and like the Black Panthers used to say, like their 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 most important slogan was "All power to the people." Like it was black power, comma, people power. Like, if we need to be thinking about how we get people power. So yeah, yeah. sorry, I kind of went on. No, no, it was fascinating. Um, thank you for your clarity. Um, that the question of kind of social fragmentation and those critiques and things that I hear in, the, in mainstream media. Um, and that, you know, this kind of brings me on to, to, to the next topic, the, the next um, question, which is kind of mass media, like misrepresentation. Um, and I was listening to a podcast that you were on, Joshua, um, at BBC Radio 5, and it was, you had so much grace and, and you were brilliant in it, but I find it quite frustrating to listen to because you had 20 minutes on the BBC and they were just asking you about this one tweet that had happened in, you know, that um, on BLM's BLM UK's Twitter and it just it's just kind of this consistency of the media to pinpoint a tiny moment in something so big and so expansive and to build so much conflict and so much argument and you have like thousands, hundreds of thousands of comments kind of of this one tweet and and it, it's just it, it's like that's the fragmentation that happens it's not being able to take this big picture it's not talking about like what's actually the vision of the black lives matter movement like where do people want to go to instead it's trying to pick pick apart all these different parts that that, that they like and the parts that that play on other people's fears of losing their own identity or losing their you know their own things um using my words here, but um, I wanted to kind of ask this question um, about um, like, what's your experience of, of media misrepresentation? Um, and what are, how can we challenge that? Like, how, how do you challenge that? How does the movements that you're a part of challenge that? Um, Lila, perhaps you'd like to go first. Yes, yes. Um, wow. I mean, <laughs> That touches very close to my heart um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, two examples uh, during the No Dapple, you know, movement to to protect water in the Sanding Rock Lakota uh, homeland. Um, it was hard because uh, there was, you know, the younger guys were kind of more like ra radical, and they were. And there was thousands of people at this camp, but you know they would kind of get a little punchy. And um, I'm, I'm not sure if they really set a fire, a, a, a tire on fire, or they, or if it was a um, what do they call it, where they embed someone into the movement. Uh, I think they call it like an instigator or something, um, or if it was someone from the other side embedded. But in any case, a tire caught on fire, <laughs> and, and this is like such a tiny thing compared to the amazing, beautiful things that went on in this camp. I mean, tribes from all over the world coming, the Sami came from, uh, from Scandinavia, the folks from South America came. I mean, it was epic. I mean, amazing speeches, you know, people were trading songs, they were trading, I mean, it was the most beautiful camp I've ever been to. Thousands of people along the Missouri River, or rather the Cannonball River, and and it was just just gorgeous. Um, so, anyways, they put that on the front page of the Bismarck Tribune of this tire on fire and this guy with this like bandana on his face, and they're like, "Oh my God, these radical people are so radical. It's scary." <laughs> Where if you look at our camp, the biggest banner in the whole front of the entry was we are unarmed. It was like, we are here to protect water and that, and we're here to pray and that is it, you know? So um, yeah, it's sad. Cause like any little slip up we do, they will twist against us and use it as ammunition. 
Um, and when you have a movement that big of thousands of people, there's no real ethical way to get everyone on the same page because you want to honor everyone's free will and what they want to do and how they want to do it. So there's that. The other thing is I ran for office last year. Um, I raised $125,000 in 20 days. Um, I was really rolling ahead. I was, I was stood a really good chance of dethroning the speaker of the house for the state of New Mexico. And uh, who was an oil tycoon uh, type of guy. And um, ooh, they didn't like me. They did not like me. And they managed to, to, to drum up some old Facebook post I had made where I was talking about rape and consent and uh, twist it into me being like a rapist. And they just plastered it all over the city. There's this horrible article of me online, if you Google my name. Uh, my um, campaign manager filed two false police reports against me. Uh, and then seems like she may have given them to the opposition. So it was just a really ugly, ugly race. Um, and politics, you know, I never knew it could be so dirty. Uh, but, you know, the media was, the, 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 the power structure must control the media, right? That is how, that's the only way they could stay afloat, right? They must control it. And so to this day, I'm trying to get an article written about the truth and no one will take it because they're butting up against this power structure. And the journalists are like, I can't. If I write this story, this guy's going to hate me. He's going to make my life hell. So they really, it's, it's all tied up together. And it's really ugly. And I was running against a Democrat as a Democrat. So it's not necessarily like, oh, only the Republicans are bad. Like it's, it's just a very sad situation where no wonder no real change can happen in politics. It's just, it's very cutthroat and dog eat dog. Um, but in any case, I think to your, the most important part of your question is what can we do about it? <laughs> and I like that question and I don't have the answer, but uh, if I could take a, take a stab at it, so to speak, um, it's a bad metaphor, but if I could take a try at it, um, I would say perhaps expose it, you know, perhaps expose that the political infrastructure and the media infrastructure are one and the same. And I know that's it's careful to say because that's what Trump says. He, he disregards media by saying, you know, so I don't want to do what he did, but a free and independent media has been chipped away at, at least in the United States context. And it's hard for us to actually have true independent journalism. Um, and I think most people are catching on to that. I mean, every, all Democrats look at Fox News as just a completely discredited organization because it's so clearly working for the Republican Party. It's not journalism. It's, it's an extension of the Republican Party. And vice versa, the Republicans look at CNN as this is clearly an extension of the Democratic Party. You know, so there's not too many uh, people who are uh, fooled by that, I think. So then it's a matter of, of, geez, I mean, it's a matter of chipping away at power structures that are deeply entrenched. And I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer than that at this moment. No, that's brilliant. I um, didn't expect you to tell us how exactly how to extricate media from the power structures, but um, it's something that, that that must happen, you know, in, in any way. Um, and Joshua, I'd love to hear kind of your perspective on this, um, on how, you know, the media has informed narratives like cultural responses to the Black Lives Matter movement or, or, or Occupy um, and how social movements have been able to respond to that, um, to challenge that and to, to build your own narratives. It's such a big, um thing is such a big question mm -hmm. um that that radio five interview um with emma barnett uh who is now of course the women's hour um host um was really indicative of something um mm -hmm. the moment the moment we made that tweet um about palestine and about solidarity with palestine 
um, we faced exactly what happened to BLM in the US, right? Like as soon as BLM in the US after Ferguson um, had uh, like a convoy that went to Palestine, as soon as they connected those dots, which is then, which is like part of the black radical tradition to be connecting the dots, right? Like to be like in um, Toronto, the BLM Toronto went to um, like a, a pipeline protest and, and spoke about um, the persecution, oppression, domination of of indigenous communities like it's always been part of our political practice so there's no like surprises there but that was a massive signal um that we are not gonna water down our politics publicly mm. this time or anytime and what that meant was um like yeah there was that on the on the bbc and there was all those um different people and commentators that came out but it also meant that um li literally lots of institutions pulled their backing right like um, the BBC were like, you're no longer allowed to wear Black Lives Matter badges. Lots of politicians were like, ah, we got you. You are political. You are like anti-capitalist. You are like da 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 da. And I think that you can be the darling of the mainstream media um, as as long as you're kind of uh, like representing a kind of liberal politics. As long as you're not, if if you if you show them you have teeth, then they will bite back at you. Mm. Um, and lots of movements have experienced that. And yeah, to, to echo what Lila said, like this absolutely foundational to the continuance of the nation state, having the having the mainstream media. It's like um, you have the repressive state apparatus, um, the courts, the prisons, the police and, and other systems like that, you know, viscerally violent. And then you have the ideological state apparatus and they both do the same work, which is uphold um, the elite. The, 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 the structure of the society and the mainstream media is so important for that. However, um, I don't think it's unbreachable. Um, and I also think it's in, it's in perpetual contestation. And, you know, the printing press, when the printing press came around, it wasn't, um, it, it wasn't an institution of the elite. It was, it, it was very quickly about proliferating knowledge, like, Printing, print, printing pamphlets about putting information in the hands of the masses. And for a long time, it was like that until it was monopolized. And, and since that time until now, it's always, there's always been like that. You know, I met a friend, uh, well, I met someone through work who hopefully she'll become my friend because she's amazing. Um, mm -hmm. She like works down the road from Old Ford Road at the center where the East London um, Federation of Suffragettes organized. And the suffragettes were demonized by the by the media right and um until they until they until that time passed where they could have a different kind of representation in the media but even now people still demonize them and, and castigate them but they had um they had the women's dreadnought which was their own paper right and this is and we this is so fundamental to our to a building movement is we need to have our own discourse and we need to be proliferating it in different kinds of ways whether that's podcasts whether that's webinars or whether that's a paper or a digital paper or a blog or whatever like we need to be building cultural institutions we have to um, otherwise we will lose if we don't build those cultural institutes and women's dreadnought was was one of those like you know it had a it had circulations of tens of thousands in in that local area and and local working class women were able to um see themselves see their own writing um create their own understandings push their own narratives um it was for us by us and of course like the black panther paper is one of the most incredible uh, forms of that and and just you know in any movement you can look at through history you will see a corresponding paper or a corresponding like cultural institution that is doing that work. Um, and, and Stuart Hall talks about po pockets in the media where, where we can be, and we need to be in those pockets. And there's a, I'll end on like, there is a bit of a danger and that actually a lot of what movements are doing now is looking at how we can be in the mainstream media and do more comms work and like, our communications need to be better we need to think about our framings we need to think about the phrase that pays it's just when we're not doing comms right enough we need to do comms better that's very important that's not to undermine that but equally important is we need to be doing our we need to be doing on our own terms we need to be building those kind of those narratives and, and institutions in our communities and around the world we need we need those papers again um yeah thank you so much um i think it's also kind of hope that um, like, you know, the majority of people learn how to be critical when they're reading newspapers. Um, 
like see the words that are being used by that newspaper and wonder why like why are they called rioters or why are they called protesters how are, how is racism being brought into the narrative of the newspaper and, and i think having like us ha developing a critical eye as we're as we're reading through through newspapers and not just kind of taking in information i think is so important and i'm sure kind of social media platforms as well whilst for all the disadvantages, um, there is also the advantage of being able to kind of directly communicate and 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 get information from the movement that you are a part of or that you want to support or from the leaders of those movements or you know the people with, within within them. Um, I think that yeah, I think that's really important. And and you, I, I think watching kind of um, like the state response to the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, really kind of lift lifted the lid on that it was just so plain to see how politicians and the media were responding to them the words that they were using um and then obviously in contrast to the white rioters who went to the capitol building and just seeing the whole you know it, it's um it's actually insane um and, and so 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 kind of so easy to see as well um that they can get away with that. Um, thank you. And and and, and Lila, I, I had no idea about that piece that was written about you or about that struggle um, when you were running um, for office. That, that must have been um, really, really challenging. I hope you do find someone to write the piece about it in the end. Um, so I'd love to now kind of move on to talk about cultural legacies and the relationship between cultural legacies and, and the visionary futures that movements are working towards. Um, we're not just shaped by our past and, and by history, we're also shaped by the futures that we participate in constructing. Um, and as Stuart Hall said, instead of thinking about people's roots, we ought to think about what are their roots, you know, the different points by which they have come to be now, you know, they are in a sense the sum of those differences. Um, Lila, I'd love to hear from you about kind of this relationship between cultural legacy and, and your vision and visionary futures um, and a, a kind of embodying the, the kind of the future you want to see. Yeah. Um, would you mind just recasting that question one more time? Yes. Um, so kind of, uh, it's a question on how you see political identities as being not just who we are, but who we want to become. Got you. Yeah, I mean, it's a little tough to have this conversation in English um, because it's such an impoverished language, as my elders say. Um, and it's hard to talk about anything really um, that is true to, I guess, our way of seeing things in Diné culture at least. Um, and so the political identity of Diné people, you know, uh, <laughs> is a uh, and what that means is nahoka means earth surface. Um, Dien means holy. Dene means beings or people. Um, and Bala'ashla means five fingers. Um, and so that is our core identity. Um, and my, my Dene elder likes to say in our cosmology, we were not born into original sin, we were born into original beauty, that our nature and our core is that of beauty. And, uh, and, and that is where we keep going from. We never, not to say we're perfect by any means, but we never really had any sin to make up for. Um, and so, Nahoka diyen dene'e belashla, to us, it means the holy earth surface walkers, the five fingered ones, the ones who were, we self identify as holy. Um, we self identify as sacred. And can you imagine what it would be like if humanity 
was allowed to self-identify as sacred and what the implications of that would be. Um, and I guess I'm actually speaking erroneously here because Nahukadi and Ashla is not confined to a specific group of people. It's actually afforded and applied to all five-fingered beings. And maybe you're missing a digit or maybe you have an extra digit, still part of the club. Um, so the club is about um, honoring our sanctity as, as earth surface beings. And we, we notice that where the earth and the sky meet, that liminal space is where life flourishes. And we saw that similar to the way a man and a woman come together to generate life, so too does the earth and the sky uh, intermingle to create life. And the, the, the sky was seen as a masculine force and the earth was seen as a feminine force. And so to be at the surface of the earth is to be a child of these two things. It is to be a holy <laughs> creation. Um, and as I look out here, I'm, I'm near Seattle now. I wish you guys could see this just phenomenal ocean, water, bay, Puget Sound, and, and the trees. And it's just so abundantly clear that we are of something very, very special. And so that's why I say it's hard to talk about this in English because the world, the world that we were able to see and be a part of was vastly different. And so to add to that a little bit, um, you know, when Diné people would come upon a new tribe or a new group of people with different customs or whatever, they were still Dene to us. Dene, Dene means people, but it's even expanded beyond that to mean being. So this tree is a Dene. That little fly is a Dene. This water is Dene. The sky is Dene. We are all beings here together. And so when we saw a new people, they were Dene, but we gave them a clan. Right, we gave them a clan. Like, okay, you are those Dene. <laughs> you know, you are. I'm the Nanisht Ejitachikni Dene. Right. So they're the Black Charcoal Street division of the Red Running Into Water clan. And I think Red Running Into Water. There's debate about what that means, but I think it means a, a part where the the rock, a streak of red rock, was running into the water. So we were part of. We were from that area. Uh, other people have different interpretations. Uh, but so we always afforded a new clan to someone. And so when we saw a new pr a people, they were still Diné. The thing that really, the only thing that really made us the Diné tribe was we spoke the same language. That was the only thing that really set us apart from others. Um, and so when you talk about political identity and who you are and who you want to become, that's really applicable to the Diné people because we are who we want to become already at birth. And there's no, I mean, we're very observant people. We observed how a human being develops we observed the first blood that comes, the menstruation, as a holy thing. We didn't, we, we didn't kind of just be like, oh, here's a tampon. Shh, go, just, just put this in. Don't tell, you know. It was a big, it's like, holy crap. You, you're, you have the blood that gives life to everyone here. Um, that was like, you know, we saw something beautiful in things that American culture doesn't even notice sometimes or the baby's first laugh 
when a baby laughs for the first time, oh, we have a big old ceremony. Everyone drops everything. And the person who made the baby laugh has to host the ceremony. And the baby is given a little thing of salt, like a little uh, container of salt. And even though it's just a little baby, you put it on the baby's hand and it gives that to everyone. Everyone comes and takes some salt. So we're teaching that baby generosity from day one. And we're honoring joy, you know, we're honoring laughter. Whereas, you know, in American culture, most people wouldn't really remember when their baby first laughed. Um, not to say, you know, I'm not trying to poo poo anything. I'm just saying we saw, we, we saw the world for what it was. We saw things in things that the world doesn't always notice. And we honored them and celebrated them. So that's the best way I can answer your question because we didn't operate within a world of power over paradigm. We didn't operate within a struggle uh, per se. Um, the last thing I'll just say on this note is that we, we actually, the reason we have these ceremonies, the reason we have these um, honoring of the first blood and honoring of the first laugh is actually <laughs> because we did experience a lot of warfare and caste systems and slavery before Columbus was even ever born. At Chaco Canyon, you know, we had caste systems and all the archeologists are like, wow, Chaco Canyon. And it's like, it is an amazing place, but it's also the place where we kind of messed up and creator sent us a drought and we had to abandon that place. Cause we had the youth, they say the youth said something needs to change. No more of this caste system. No. So our, our culture of equality, of humility, of generosity, that was actually born out of intense strife, intense inequality. You know, we had slavery here way before um, the transatlantic slave trade was ever born. We enslaved each other here. Um, and so we learned through the trial of fire why equality was so important. We learned by butting up against the, the, the pain of, of inequality, the pain of hatred, the pain of dehumanization, why honoring our humanity is so important. So and I like to think that we as a global society, a, a more globalized society, that we are in that fire right now. We are feeling that burn of what it feels like to dehumanize each other. To, 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 to fall into a warfare. And it might not be tomorrow, it might not be next month, but we are learning, we're in the crucible that my ancestors were in many thousands of years ago of like, okay, this doesn't work. Patriarchy doesn't work. Caste systems do not work. Slavery does not work. Uh, human centricity does not work. So the only way we got to this point where our political identity as Nahokadi and Dene'ebala Ashla was, was present uh, is because we went through that trial. And now that we're here as Dene people in this place of being more evolved as a, as a society, we don't need to go anywhere anymore. We know of our beauty and we know it's who we are and what, why we came. Thank you, Laila. It's a really powerful response. Um, Joshua, um, I'd like to invite you to, to respond to Laila, um, either directly or um, unfolding this other dimension of, of this kind of question, which is how do we, um, how do you um, feel within social movements um, that one can honor specific histories, traditions, and cultures, yet build politically transformative visions um, that carry universal power. Um, yeah. I'm like, I don't really know what to say beyond <laughs> what Lali just said. Um, also, like, I just saw this really cute mouse just run across my feet. <laughs> Um, I saw this, um, there's, there's this incredible um, activist scholar, um, author, revolutionary thinker from America called Robin Kelly, Robin D.G. Kelly. <clears throat> He's really amazing. He's got a book called Freedom Dreams. 
um, they're so important for like thinking about our imagination and imagining our way out of, out of anti cap out of capitalism. And he was giving this talk recently, and he said like um, he spoke about how at his desk in the drawer he has this um, post-it note that he always looks at and kind of starts the day with this kind of mantra. And the mantra is love, study, struggle. And for me, like the, the struggle, the engaging in the struggle to fight for a new world and studying um, in order to kind of expand our minds and study doesn't just mean like pick up a book and read. It means like conversations with people. It means visiting memorial sites. It means, you know, study for me is a very expansive thing here. Like we honor that through love and love, how I understand it from him is not just like, a, you know, forget about the romantic love and all that bullshit. Love is about like, love for me is a return to the, to the, it's about giving people sanctity. It's about um, it, everything that Lila just said for me is, is what love is about. And um, it's in our day to day, it's in how we relate to uh, our environment on a day to day basis, how we relate to people on a day to day basis and all, all the creatures on, on the planet on a day to day basis it's about returning to them their sanctity. And by doing that, returning to us our sanctity. And there's um, a really great uh, quote from Bell Hooks where she talks like she says, and I just dug it out while, while she was speaking. She says, I feel our nation's turning away from love moving into a wilderness of spirit so intense, we may never find our home again, our way home again. I write of love to bear witness both to the danger in this movement and moment and to call for a return to love. And Bell Hooks is like an, a, a black um, feminist activist scholar, I think are really important if you haven't heard of her. And the book is all about love. And that thing about return to love, I think is, that is the, that is the future place. And somebody was like in an interview was like, what is, what, what is, Black liberation look like? And I was like, I couldn't possibly tell you, you know, what the future holds for us. But what I can say with some certainty is that we're trying to return to a place of love and trying to return to a place of like a radically humanizing recognition of each other and of our shared experience. Like what what Lila's what Lila so beautifully put is like we, you know, we we have such a deep shared experience with each other. We all suffer. We are all suffering in various ways as part of the human condition, whether that's through illness, whether that's through um, uh, death, whether that's through like oppression, like we all find suffering and we have a, and we have universal experiences here and we have, and, and being on the planet as, as a human, you know, we've made it, we, we've conditioned ourselves to be so protected from some of the natural things that we have to contend with, but we've done that we've done that through destroying the environment and to be on this planet is sometimes difficult and yeah and so for like for me a return to love and return to sanctity um sanctity and, and sacredness just there's a um i think this year is 30 years i think since the first national people of color environmental summit maybe even longer i think it was 1991 and that was like an, a really important environmental summit um, and an important, they made an important declaration. And the first principle that they laid out was like, we assert the sanctity and sacredness and interconnectedness of mother earth to all beings. Um, that's the starting point, you know, like if, and yeah, the 1991 principles of environmental justice, thank you very much. Um, yeah, and the first one you see is about that assertion. And that's that's where I think we're going to. And I think part of, part of where we're, going to with that just finally is like in in Islam um there's a uh, there's a lot of language and poetry around this sanctity and around the sacredness and I think um you know the, the the Quran ends with like he loves them and they love him and the in in Sufism and in in Tasawwuf like in a lot of Islam it's about the lover and the beloved the beloved and the lover and, and love being the thing that binds all things and the thing that I love growing up around lots of friends that are Muslim is like at every, at the end of like every sentence or at the end, like in every conversation, there's several points where they're, they're giving praise. Praise be to God for this, praise be to God for that, praise be to God for this, for this beautiful sunny day, praise be to God for your new child, praise be to God for this food that we have. And one of the things that I think we'll ho hopefully go towards, and this is a thing that's universal in so many cultures is like we, yeah, exactly. Mashallah. Like we give, 
hopefully we'll go to a, to a place in the future where we give praise for all the abundance and, and beauty in the world around us and with each other and to celebrate. And when, when you asked that, when that question came up, one of the things that just instantly came to my head was, um, and this is so random maybe in the context of what we're talking about, but the GLC, um, which was the Greater London Council, um, it was like the, the authority over London for like the 70s and the 80s, I think it was, um, until Thatcher abolished it. But one of the, incre and this, um, this governing body did lots of very profound and important works for London, and it's great to go and research them. There's an archive called GLC Stories if you want to find out more. One of the things that was like part of their legacy was that there was so many um, festivals. They introduced so many more festivals into, into our communities where we celebrate our differences and we celebrate our communities and, and we celebrate resistance and cultures. And I hope that's part of where we go to is about celebrating, praising and returning to love. Um, yeah, and, and a lot of that finds its roots in our, our communities and in our resistance and all of those fe festivities that I speak about were tied to communities of resistance. So, yeah. Thank you so much. I love the three of love, study and struggle. And it reminds me of um, three principles that I try and apply, which is reflection, action and acceptance, but they're just different, really um, different, but really beautiful. Um, we have a question from the audience, which is uh, from Stefania Grasso. One of the biggest challenges we face in, I think, HR is human rights. Um, when does it go for human rights organizations in Mexico is dealing with toxic power dynamics based on systems of oppression which are replicated within the human rights organizations, such as patriarchal violence, authoritarian leadership, etc. It is some sort of taboo. How can we boost conversation to tackle this issue? Um, I might just open that up to either of you, if, if one of you would like to respond. Yeah, so if I understand the question correctly, it's that within the movements, there is toxicity such as patriarchy. Is that kind of what she's saying? Here's yeah, that. yeah. Um, she, uh, she, she said organizations, but let's bring it into movements. Um, I'm just going to put yeah. it in the chat as well. Well, yeah, I, I saw this question go by. Um, so I, I'm going to plug this in just because my computer is heating up. Um, yeah, I saw that question go by, and I think it's really important. Um, I, in the native movements here in, in what we call the United States, um, there is a lot of patriarchy sometimes, and uh, it's always really disappointing. And by patriarchy, I mean womanizing. And by womanizing, I mean complete disregard for like an extractive relationship with women um, where they where there's a lot of taking but not much giving um, and uh, and and I often say like no matter how many sacred sites we save no matter how many pipelines we stop if we're not honoring the source of life the women of of our movement then uh then we've we might have won some battles but we lost the war um and and there's reasons why i think that which would be hard to explain briefly but essentially in in our various cultures and worldviews uh replete throughout you know all the hundreds of indigenous nations that live on this continent there's a really heavy emphasis on honoring women uh mothers um and uh, the feminine in general. And um, so much so that, you know, back in the day when the people were starving and, and, and everything was a mess, you know, the, there's the story of, of white, the white buffalo calf woman who came to help the people. And, and they were just not in a good place. Uh, and so when white buffalo calf woman came, she gave them the pipe which is uh, not something I can really talk about here in, in depth, but suffice it to say that it, it represents the masculine and the feminine joining together in a context of, of, of sanctity. 
and respect and reciprocity. And it's just interesting to me that they were starving, they had political discord, they had all these issues. And what she said is your real problem is this, this nexus between the masculine and feminine, that is your actual problem. And if you could heal that, then if you can heal the women, you can heal the world. And that's not to exclude the healing of men from that. The healing of women, women is part and parcel of the healing of men. And, and in and around that and in, enveloped by that is the healing of trans uh, relatives and non-binary relatives uh, as well. Um, and so I think in that sense, um, I really thank you for your question. I think it's really important. Uh, I don't have an answer except for that. <sighs> Maybe just stop having war <laughs> because the war, one of the main tactics of war, right, is rape. Uh, you see it all the time. The US soldiers are trained to rape women in Afghanistan. They're trained to rape women in Iraq. They're literally trained. I, I have first account knowledge of a brother who was in the US Army and they trained him to rape the women. Um, the Romans raped the women, you know? And, and so what happens is when you rape the women, you're not just hurting them, you're hurting the men who love her, right? You're, you're making him feel like he failed to protect her when he didn't, there was nothing he could have done. And so when the men feel like they fail to protect, like in the case of uh, uh, my people in 1864, thousands of us were put in a concentration camp outside of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and thousands of us died in this camp. And, and the water, water was the currency was with which they held our dignity ransom. They said, if you want water, because we, we, we were there, held there for four years, and the water is how they control it. So if you want water for your kids, they would say to the women, you come to my barracks tonight and we'll have sex and then I'll give you some water. So this is how they systematically raped our women in this camp. And our men, our, her brothers, her nephews, her uncles, her grandpas were there too at gunpoint having to listen to and see and hear their own women be raped systematically. So this camp was designed to destroy not our bodies, but our spirits. Um, so I'll just wrap up by saying, because of that, our men, I really feel for them because now they're trying to overcompensate. If they feel like they failed to protect, which they didn't, there was nothing they could have done. They were at gunpoint. But if they believe that trick, then now they have to get the big truck or a lot of money or sleep with a lot of women to feel man again. And so I think that's the issue with a lot of these things is we need to stop the womanizing, but where does the womanizing come from? It comes from the, the trick that they've been emasculated, which leads to all of these overcompensation behaviors. So uh, that's a really convoluted answer to your question, but uh, for what it's worth, I think it's a really important question. Um, and I think to heal that nexus is one of our top priorities. Thank you, Laila. That was a really important response and dimension to bring in, into the discussion. Um, Joshua, would you, would you like to, to, to respond to Laila or to the question? Otherwise, I have a final question. Um, um, the, only, the only maybe quick thing I'd say is Mm. Lots of organizations after what happened. Um, I mean, maybe it's different in, in development and human rights and international law and stuff, but like a lot of organizations after last year, after the summer pro protest, the protests of last year's summer, um, have begun to like, like think about how they need to change and how they have systems of oppression and exploitation within them and specifically around racism. And they've began processes. And 
the organization I work with is also going through a process like this. But especially in large human rights organizations, I think there's this like deep denial that they are sites of oppression and exploitation. Like one of the biggest human rights organizations um, had multiple suicides in there because of the exploitation of their workers in there. And I think like, especially in the, in the third sector and in NGOs, we really, really need to have a higher standard of how we work with each other and how we treat, these, treat individuals who are actually doing very important work for, for the world. And so what I'd say is like, we have to like name the hypocrisy loudly and clearly within our organizations. We need to do that safely. So the first thing is like, think about think about how to do that safely and securely so like if if there's not a union in your organization um you need to bring a union into your organization and you need to speak with your colleagues and you need to think about how to become unionized um then together you need to build a strategy for how you're going to name this hypocrisy loud and clear and 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 offer a strategic route for the organization to begin to build out, build structures to tackle um, authoritarian leadership, patriarchal violence, um, racist programs, whatever it is. You know, these organizations have theories of change, um, large strategies for how they're gonna build their, um, their evaluative frameworks in whatever part of the world. They should have theories of change and invest, them, invest their resources into how they are going to strategically undermine these um, sites of violence within the organization they have to do that um and we and, and unfortunately like we as workers will have to prompt them to do that because they won't do that um you know they will uh, many people know the ngo um the, the third sector is less representative of, of uh, general society than the, the the top 100 companies of the FTSE 100 like Ch charities in the, in the third sector and HR organizations, the development world is it, industry is worse than a lot of other industries. So we have to do that. Um, and what I'd say is like, yes, yeah, safely and securely come together and name it and strategic. And, and when, when they're like, yeah, this is wonderful. Like you, you want to make a caucus? Great. And we'll give, you know, and we'll give you um, some, some, some staff time. Be like, Nah, we want you to put some serious resources towards this. We want we want to be able to hire consultants and be able to carve out time. We don't want this to be unless you want it to be a work. You need to make demands, you know. But to do that safely, you need to be unionized. Um, so, yeah. Um, but we we really do need to do that in in our workplaces, especially in 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 those sectors. And solidarity to you, and good luck to you in that journey. And I hope you succeed. Mm. Thank you, Joshua. And um, Lila, I, I, I'm aware that you have to slip off now. And um, I just want to say thank you so, so much for your time and for sharing your wisdom um, and your energy in, in today's session. Um, I personally have learned so much um, from you again. And um, yeah, just feeling really, really grateful for you joining this conversation. Yeah, thank you, sister. And thank you, Joshua. And Thanks to Amelia as well. It was really an honor to spend some time with you and you educated me a lot. So I really appreciate it. So uh, yeah, we'll be in touch. Thank you for your time. Take care. Okay. Thank you. Um, Joshua, if you don't mind, I have one more question for you before um, we wrap up the session. I can, I can try. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just when we're, it's just a final question about power. I mean, you've spoken to this already really beautifully. But I just wanted to end end it and the conversation kind of looking ahead. Um, so in terms of empowerment and movement power, is there an image that comes to mind for you uh, when you close your eyes and, and you think about power in this way? Yeah, there's loads. <laughs> there's, loads. Um, there's so many instances where and, and it's so important to go and find them. And I, I'll, I'll maybe name a couple now, but like we should always have 10 to the mind. Like we should always have them there because when people are like, you know, I had a really difficult conversation with a family member yesterday, part of the family, extended family. And he was like, um, 
he was just like, this is, you know, I watched this talk that you did and I found it very difficult and you said these things. And, I, and it, a lot of it came to the thing of like, there is no alternative. But, so we need to have lots of examples of when we've struggled and won and built power. Um, that's really important to us. Um, so like, and recently I was reading more about 68, um, May 68 in, in, in Paris, but also around the world, you know, like that year was a year where there was like a serious contestation between people power movements and, and the elite structures of, of the world. And, and it was the country, it was the year that my, um, my parents no longer were colonial subjects of Britain. Um, where we got independence and it, that was a really important moment but I guess in terms of like what what represents that power and what images come to mind the first things that came to mind was like thinking about uh, what it means to organize with people as whole people or you know Jane McAlevey is this incredible um, union and labor organizer in the states and she talks about whole worker organizing um, so like when when we come to people and we talk about and we meet them they are a multitude of things they're a parent they are a worker they are a part of a congregation they are um connected to families that are abroad and they're sending remittances there's people are so many different things in one moment and we shouldn't exclude all those different ways that people are, are being and are in struggle when we come to them so like there's this really great essay that she's written called it, it takes a community and, the, and it's just basically this one case study of like one of the really important struggles that, sh that she partook in. And I'd recommend so highly that you go and read it because it's just what they won was incredible. Like they, they didn't stop like one housing estate being destroyed. They stopped two housing estates being destroyed. They didn't just stop them being destroyed. They got tens of millions put back into those estates. The residents stayed there and they re 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 redone those estates for that community. They didn't just get one person into the local council. They got two people of color into the local council, into the local school board. They unionized lots of jobs and they increased the wages for those jobs because they, when they, when that union came to organize, they realized that the power is in, in like bringing people into the strategy and allowing them to be in, in charge of that, but also approaching them as whole people and whole communities. And I think, that person that I said that I, <laughs> I want her to be my friend. Um, I met her, I interviewed her um, yesterday, yesterday. And she was speaking about this incredible food co-op that she is the coordinator for. And she was speaking about um, Sylvia Pankhurst. And, the, and she, she was speaking about the East London Women's Federation. And again, like, it wasn't just about suffrage. It was about work. It was about job security. It was about food. They started, they made food co-ops and they made a whole structure for people to be able to access food. And, and they did to toy co-ops. It was about work and it was about anti-imperialism. They spoke about how wars and imperialism in other parts of the world are intimately connected to their struggle here. And it's the same people who are dividing. The, and they just connected it all up. And that was like whole community organizing. And I think, um, you know, this summer we're going to have a film from Warner Brothers called um, Judas and the Black Messiah, um, which is about Fred Hampton, who was the kind of like um, one of the leaders of the Chicago chapter of the Black Panther. And they are like such an important example of like movement power. Like they are, when, when we speak about um, identity politics as, as a route to coalitional politics, from the Combat River Collective, they what what they had they had this um, group called the Rainbow Coalition, and that was like coalition of politics at its at its most vibrant and like most empowering. It was like how did they, they brought together like so many seemingly disparate communities, gangs, like um, um, community struggling in the um, East Asian community, in the Latin American community, in the in the American in the indigenous community in the poor white community, um, student organizations, there was like, like so many groups that came together and they were like, we've got shared interests here and we need to fight together. And they brought to life that, that slogan of all power to the people. They were like, that means we need to kind of fight across, fight across and through these differences and struggle together. There was, there's so many images, but I, yeah. And I just think we really need to continue to dig them out and celebrate them and hold them in mind. Amazing. Thank you, Joshua. Um, 
feel like that's something that perhaps everyone in the call can engage in is that practice of kind of closing your eyes and seeing what images come to mind when you envisage kind of movement power, what that looks like. Um, I think keeping like a, a visionary mind of where we're moving towards is always so important um, to kind of inspire the, the present that we're in right now. Um, and I've absolutely loved this conversation. Um, and I'm so grateful to you, Joshua, for, for spending this time. And I'm sorry that you're now the last one left, so it's been um, all attention on you now, but um, it's really been uh, really incredible. And I loved how kind of humanization, um, sanctity, um, wholeness um, keeps coming up throughout this conversation from the very beginning <clears throat> um, when, when, when L Lila started. Um, and I just, yeah, the, the, the way the conversation has evolved, how much has been unfolded into it. It's just, I've learned so much from you all. So thank you very much. And I hope that <clears throat> everyone who's listening in on the call feels the same way. Um, <clears throat> sorry, is there um, a way that we can kind of um, follow your work or read your book or kind of where can we, can, where we, where can we get it? Um, is there a way to kind of support you um. in those ways? Yeah, sure. If you want to get a copy of the book, you is how to change it. Um, and it's on Murky Books, which is like collaboration between Stormzy and Penguin. And you can find it at Blackwells or Waterstones or um, like check with your local bookstore. If they don't stock it, then ask them to stock it. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it's really useful for like for new for newcomers to activism or for like people who are a bit more long in the tooth, just to kind of you know, there's lots of stories of how we've struggled kind of thinking about it in a bit of a more of a systematic way it's um called how to change it um i forgot what the subtitle is <laughs> <laughs> but yeah um yeah and I, I guess i just i'll just say like like it's been super inspirational to hear these things and i think you're absolutely right that a return to sanctity and a return to sacredness and a return to love is at the heart of this and i think in moments of crisis is when we have the biggest opportunity to do that and the biggest opportunity and, and we and we see it like at Grenfell we saw people come together in such a profound and beautiful way with the mutual aid we see people come together in such a profound and beautiful way with love that is a return to love people's compulsion is to love and care for one another and in this pandemic and in the fallout all of us here and through this climate crisis we all have a big opportunity to to do that loving to do that return on a day-to-day -day basis you know with ourselves with our kin and with our community and with the world so you know there's a big there's a big change of coming and we can be part of it for sure beautiful those are wonderful words to end on thank you so much joshua um just to say to to everyone who's um part of the regenerative activism series that um Next Wednesday, we're going to gather again to explore global movements, power, resource, and resilience um, with Kumi Naidu, Nemo Bassi, and Silji Lundberg. Um, so that's next Wednesday. And then the Wednesday after that is Psychosocial Practices for Sustaining Our Movements. And then the following Sunday is the Regenerative Activism Workshop that's looking at building and sustaining our movements. And we're kind of going to be bringing together many of the different threads, um, what well, ULEC's project <laughs> and NG is going to be bringing together all of the threads um, to kind of put more into a practical half day workshop for us to like explore and dig deeper into um, already just today as well so much has been unfolded into this conversation so I'm really looking forward to kind of having some time to, to process with that. Um, also I'm aware that because Amelia wasn't um, had to leave for half an hour we didn't do um, the grounding uh, practice at the beginning so because I there's a few minutes left um, I thought it'd be nice for those who want to stay to do that, um, that we can do that together. Joshua, feel free to um, to, to sign out um, at any point and just thank you so much for, for joining us and, and for sharing your wisdom. Um, so if you would like to do this grounding practice, just come to sit, it'll just be a few minutes, just come to sit comfortably, perhaps with your feet on the floor. And just connect to the sensation or, or bring your awareness down into the soles of the feet so that you can feel the sensation of the feet meeting the ground or the ground meeting the feet.
and then just feel the center of the chest lift up a little towards the ceiling. So you're extending the spine just through the center of the chest. And then perhaps you can just drop your chin down a little to lengthen the back of the neck. Feel the shoulders relax or just move down a little. And then start to watch the breath as it moves in and watch it as it moves out. So you have this awareness still of the feet touching the ground, of the surface underneath you supporting you. The spine is lifting tall and the body is expanding and contracting with the breath. Perhaps you can make your inhale just a little longer, a little more expansive. Perhaps you can make your exhale a little smoother, a little more complete. And just connecting to the sensation of the body as the breath moves in and out. Just introduce a short pause in between each breath. This moment of stillness. And just notice if there's, um, notice how it feels in those pauses for yourself. Notice what happens in the pause. Bringing the awareness back to the soles of the feet and just being aware of the body as a whole. Still aware of the breath, still cultivating those rhythmic patterns of breath. And then you can gently come to open the eyes. And still having that sensation of the feet on the floor, just kind of move the head a little to take in the room around you. And um, we'll finish there. Although I invite you to continue um, breathing. <laughs> well, obviously breathing, but the breathing practice after. And um, just thank you everyone so much for um, joining the Regenerative Activism Series um, and for listening in today. And thank you again, Joshua.